Sharing opinions on video games, or really any forms of media on the internet, has always seemed to be a pretty controversial thing, especially in regards to criticism. Heck, there's lots of people out there who hate my guts for my criticisms on the modern business decisions of Pokemon, and there's even others on that same video that put me up on some grand pedestal and anybody who disagrees with me has to be so blatantly wrong. It's crazy to think that something like a series of children slash family games can make people so heated, so adamant, so ready to be at each other's throats, and not just about Pokemon, but countless other media IPs out there. So, with the upcoming Pokemon remasters right around the corner, and what a mess that's guaranteed to ensue on the internet, I figured this would be an important time to discuss what it really means to have an opinion on a game or series, as well as quash some notions some seem to have about the way you should be expected to treat them. First off, why do people get so heated about media anyway? Take almost any other product out there. Let's say there's a site selling, I don't know, HDMI cables, and there's people who really like these HDMI cables, and people who really don't like these HDMI cables. You're not really going to be seeing these people going to war with one another in the review section of the page, or going to Twitter just to rage at how much they disagree about HDMI cables. This just really isn't the kind of thing you see happening with non-media-based products much of ever. Like, I'm sure it's happened, but it's not really something that happens. And yet, we see this happening all the time for products being sold if it's media-based, like video games, movies, music, even books. The reason why people get much more commonly heated about media-based products, in my opinion, is because media has a social and cultural impact on us and our lives. In a way, we look to media to draw parallels to our own lives and world. Let's say I'm playing Tales of Arise, and the story in that game draws parallels to and makes arguments about loneliness, how you can feel like maybe those around you just want something to gain from you, what the fear of being alone is like, and the feeling that you're undeserving of affection. That resonates with me because it's something I relate to. It goes in my mind from a good story to a great story when it becomes relatable, or makes arguments that I really care about. Like, take my favorite game, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky. It makes the argument that it's not about how long you live, it's about what you accomplish with your life. I find that really inspiring, and I adopt this view from a product I've purchased into the way I live my life. You could say it's had a social and cultural impact on the way I live. If somebody's criticizing these stories, maybe I inadvertently wind up going down a slippery slope, thinking that they're insulting an idea that I really resonated with, or they're insulting an ideal I've adopted into my own life. Let the Twitter war ensue. Those could be some of the ways people get heated about storytelling, but in movies, games, and the music industry, we can see disputes over music, and in games it can happen over gameplay as well. For music, everyone has their own preferences. Music, in my mind, is a tool to build the world around you, and bring you closer to some desired emotion and feel. Maybe it achieves that for you, or you interpret it in some other creative way and it really resonates with you. Gameplay directly puts you in this other world. Games are the only form of media where you as the player drive this narrative and world forward, and that's truly fascinating. It's your world to explore, to have your own adventure in, and that ideal adventure may be different for everyone. Maybe you really enjoy taking things nice and slowly doing various tasks and building up bonds with the villagers around you. But maybe somebody says that's just some dumb kitty game that's too slow paced to be enjoyable, and maybe you can't help but feel offended because it's like they've just insulted your ideal adventure, even if it isn't theirs. It's very easy for people to get heated over things that have social and cultural impacts or arguments. Heck, it's the whole reason why people often tend to feel the most strongly about the realism in social and cultural depictions in games over the realism of any other depictions games make. Take Battlefield 5 for example. People lost their minds at one of the trailers for the game like, what? There weren't women fighting in World War II? Even though there technically were, yeah. And what's that? A claw hand? There's no way that existed back then. Even though a patent for that did actually exist at the time. People take problems with things like that, but the fact that you can be shot multiple times, use a medkit in a couple seconds and then be feeling 100% again? Nope. That's perfectly fine. Or the fact that a player can literally climb into an airplane mid-flight 
climbing through the propeller. Yep, that's fine too. Nobody really complaining about that. Or in my video essay on the accuracy of historical video games, I talked about how people can get really, really mad when they think some game is trying to represent the ideal group of whatever they're a part of. Like when it came to the release of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, there were a lot of people mad like, it's unrealistic for chess to be like that, for someone to be expected to behave that way, to be able to do crazy flips like that. Well, you know what else is unrealistic? Being able to summon a freaking flaming sword that lets you glimpse into the future, being able to summon a life and fellow intelligent person for all intents and purposes from touching a crystal thing, being able to shoot a massive friggin' laser down from space onto the heads of your enemies, and at any time of day too, like does this thing not orbit? But these aren't things that people find as reason to hate. Why? Because it's not the social and cultural aspects of said game. So that's my interpretation for why it can be so easy to get heated over things like video games, and especially the parts that have social and cultural impacts. Because in a way, that's what video games are. They are a social and cultural impact on our lives. So now that we've established one of the larger reasons why people get heated in the first place, let's discuss some of the notions we need to remember when making and regarding arguments some may make towards video games and forms of arguments some may make whether they hold up or not. While these IPs may have a social and cultural impact and have a big part in your life, like I freaking love series like Pokemon, Xenoblade, and Fire Emblem, it's important to remember that these are still products being sold. I may have played several Fire Emblem games leading up to Three Houses, starting from a bit before the 3DS, and loved my experience with them because of incredible music and challenging gameplay that made me feel hella smart for conquering the hardest difficulties. I may have grown up playing Pokemon. Heck, I mentioned earlier how my favorite game straight up is a Pokemon game, being Explorers of Sky, and I had those I grew up with who would also play with me. Xenoblade 1 may have blown my socks off, and I've enjoyed the Xenoblade titles since then. But none of these titles are charity work to share an experience with the world. There's still a product being sold. I see a lot of people have this mentality towards certain games of you need to give it a chance, or why can't you just appreciate all the hard work they've done for you? These are companies trying to sell you a product. At the end of the day, you don't owe them anything. If you want to pick up some game or not, that's your choice. I see it a lot around Pokemon especially, of people saying you need to just be grateful for what has been done. It's not a charity, it's a business. They're not your pals, but sometimes the social and cultural impacts media has on our lives can make it easy to forget that when it feels like something has had such a profound impact on your life. Don't let anybody tell you you should be obligated to be appreciative for somebody selling you a product for profit. If you decide it's a good product, you pick it up and enjoy it, Heck yeah, you can be appreciative and share your passion. If you decide it's not a worthwhile product, nobody has the right to decide you're wrong to not be spending your money on this product. And don't ever be in the position where you're suggesting that someone is supposed to be more or less appreciative than they are about a product being sold. It's their likes and dislikes and their wallets. These are multi-billion dollar companies selling these kinds of games. They don't need these unsung heroes out there defending their good name from all the non-believers. It's perfectly alright to be passionate about the media that really resonates with you in your life, but don't treat it like a cult, where you feel the need to keep people within a certain way of thinking. But anyway, let's go through some of the other arguments or notions some seem to have about various games. I'll be taking a lot of these examples from the comments of my Pokemon video essay. Anything will become controversial once it gets big enough. Some seem to have this idea that Pokemon or other game IPs that have started getting more mixed reception is simply because they've gotten bigger, but this really doesn't make sense. Take some other Nintendo IPs for example. Remember when everyone just hated Breath of the Wild, since Zelda's such a large IP after all? Or what about Mario Odyssey? Man, when that game released, Mario's just so big I just couldn't suppress this animalistic urge to hate. Nobody hates something because it's done well for itself. A more realistic reason for hating something tied to success is people feeling that maybe that success hasn't been used in the right way. Or maybe that it wasn't earned or it was acquired in underhanded ways. Or maybe the success is a missed opportunity to make more of an impact. But none of these things are because of said success. Everybody is going to have their own opinion on products being sold, 
and the notion that once something gets large enough, it just awakens this primal instinct within us humans to think less and less of it is just blatantly false, and a complete distraction from the real reasons people have for disliking whatever it is they dislike. If you're not happy, just do it yourself! I see this argument literally all the time. We have the privilege of living in a society built up by the work of countless specialists we can enjoy the fruits of the labor of. You don't have to be an architect to live in a structurally sound house. You don't need to be a mechanic to be able to drive a car. You don't have to be a software engineer to be able to use programs on your computer. You don't have to be a movie director to watch a movie. You don't have to be an electrician to be able to use anything involving electricity. You don't have to be a chef to eat food. In the early days of human history, you and your tribe's knowledge of the world would have been limited to just the observable world around you. And I'm sure with a bit of doing, you could adopt pretty much whatever specialist role you want. Want to be a hunter? Go for it. Want to care for the young? Sure, go ahead. Want to make fire and do some basic cooking? Sure thing. But nowadays, if you want to become a specialist in something, go do grade school for 12 years, then do a four-year program, maybe eight-year program, maybe even 12. My program to help me become a specialist in game design is probably going to take me seven years when it's all done. Heck, there's so much knowledge and skills you could develop that you could stay in school your whole life if you had the time and money. But the thing is, you don't need to understand everything. We live in such a complicated society where we are able to enjoy the fruits of not just our own knowledge and skill sets, but the knowledge and skill sets of our collective civilization's accomplishments. No one person could ever be capable of having an intimate understanding of every brick that makes up the foundation of our world, but they don't have to they can still enjoy this full foundation. But this idea is very scary for some people. It's why we see some people only accepting what they themselves can see and do in the world around them. It's how flat earth communities have taken off so much, and apparently the logic some will use if you have criticism for the way a game is. Imagine if this kind of logic was used in other industries. Let's say your TV remote ran out of battery, so you go to the store and buy AA batteries. You start using them, and they run out of charge within a couple days. So you go to the store and complain, and the clerk tells you, Well, how about you make standard size single cell cylindrical alkaline dry batteries? What? I can't do that. That's the reason I came and bought one from you. Well, if you're so clueless yourself, you're not allowed to have an opinion on what's good and bad. This is such a weird line of reasoning, and I have no idea where the heck it came from and why so many people use it in regards to the gaming industry. You don't have to work at a bakery to be able to identify moldy bread. If you don't like X game, just make it yourself. Ah, yes, I'll just one-up the multi-billion dollar company. Let me just get my hundreds of staff and pull tens of millions of dollars out of my pocket. How much do you think YouTubers like me make anyway? Here's an interesting one. Heaven forbid there be... <gasps> CHANGE! Oh no! So, by this line of reasoning, if you've been buying a coffee at this one place for a long time, and one day you pay for a coffee and they give you water, and you complain that this isn't the coffee you ordered, a perfectly reasonable response from the shop clerk is, Heaven forbid there be change! Oh no! Again, thank goodness our society doesn't follow these strange kinds of twisted logic. Everybody will have their own opinions on different things. Some will like change in a certain direction, others not. Somehow, people seem to forget this. It's just like those people who argue that anything will become hated when it's big, that it just awakens this primal animalistic instinct to hate. Only this time, the argument is that change will awaken this instinct to hate. That's not at all how it works, and is a meaningless distraction from the actual issues. If I buy a drink at a restaurant, and they fill it with a rat poison, I'm not going to be mad because there was change. I'm going to be mad because they just put rat poison in my drink. To tackle an issue properly, you need to actually acknowledge what that change is and how to address it. You can't just give it the umbrella term of change and assume that's the thing people take issue with, good or bad. Some seem to think that for whatever reason, you're not actually allowed to glean information on a game before it's released. Wait, isn't that the whole point of trailers before release? to help inform customers on new information so they can make a decision about whether to buy it or not, with the marketing being handled in such a way to try to convince them that it is worth their money. So maybe it's alright to infer the positive parts of the information shared, but not the negative parts? So let's say EA reveals a new game and tells you, 
this is going to be the most loot box filled game yet. Gotcha mechanics and paywalls will be the only way to progress, and there will only be one playable character who's the weakest of them all unless you pay up for these mechanics on top of the full price you already paid for the game. Are you not allowed to judge that information until the game comes out? Trailers and news exist to share information about a game, for people to form opinions on. What, are you just not allowed to have an opinion on stuff confirmed to be part of a game until it's out for real? How the heck would you ever buy any game ever if you're not allowed to have any opinion on it before picking it up? What do you want people to do when they see a new trailer? Just not think about it? Just be like, a new trailer for our game just released? Ignore it. It cannot yet exist in our mindscape until the game releases. How dare that information just think it can live in our minds rent free. Shame on you, information! This is information the producer is choosing to share with the consumer. The whole reason for doing that is to inform the consumer so they can have their own opinion on it by the time it comes out, as opposed to not knowing anything about the game. I've had countless comments from people saying that you're not allowed to criticize something when you're not the target audience. How does that make any sense? So if Granny has been getting calls from people saying she owes them money and she's been sending them hundreds of dollars in gift cards, that's great. You do you, Granny. Hey, I'm not actually allowed to have an opinion because Granny and people in her age range are the target audience, not me. Isn't it our job to help protect those we care about, especially those the most vulnerable such as the youngest and oldest of us? Like, if the day ever comes that I have a kid, I'm keeping that kid away from gotcha and freemium games and will absolutely take the time to explain to said kid why I feel the way I do about it. Or if said kid really wants X game when it comes out because of a pre-order bonus, sure, but I will absolutely take the time to explain what the fear of missing out is and how companies will exploit it to get people on the fence about buying to go out and do it before they lose permanently missable content. I'm pretty sure it's our responsibility as adults to help protect those vulnerable around us. Isn't that part of what parenting entails? And to be critical of products that these kids cannot yet be critical of themselves. I don't think there's any kid that's gonna be like, I would like to play this game, but the gotcha mechanics and weight walls promote an environment for addiction by limiting my dopamine to keep the player coming back. The fear of missing out being employed here is a way to artificially increase sales. Using the game as a service model, this company is able to get away with not releasing the full product and keep users returning for more new content as time goes on. No, no kid is gonna be like that. Kids are gonna be like, this looks cool and fun. Please don't ever fall into the notion that you're not allowed to have an opinion on something because you're not the target audience. Would that mean that anybody who's not a kid isn't allowed to have an opinion on the whole YouTube kids situation? Anybody who's not a gamer isn't allowed to have an opinion on the legality of loot boxes and gacha mechanics? Do you consider them ethical? So what we look at as, as surprise mechanics. Um, anybody who's not a senior isn't allowed to have an opinion on phone scams targeting seniors? A lot of these arguments we've seen so far have been very similar, saying you're not allowed to have an opinion on something if you don't have the expertise to make it better on your own. You're not allowed to have an opinion on something if it's information on something not out yet. You're not allowed to have an opinion on something if you're not the target audience. Why is it that so many people are so quick to jump onto the you're not allowed to have an opinion bandwagon? I really don't get it. Everybody is entitled to their opinion. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. One more argument I want to address is another pretty common one I've seen for Pokemon that can also be used for pretty much any other game ever. And it's people saying that those making the game are the experts. It's not our place to judge them, because what they're making is just their ideal vision coming to life. These are three statements I feel like I've seen together as a package deal like this time and time again. And we've already talked a bit about the first two. But the third one is where things get interesting that the reason why games turn out the way they are is because it's someone's creative vision coming to life, the ideal version of the game they want to play. There are definitely games where this is the case. After my video essay on the Rollercoaster Tycoon series, where I called the original titles a project of passion, I actually received an email from the graphic designer on the original two games, Simon Foster, who told me that I was correct in my inference. It really was a project of passion, and he shared some of the development with me. One of the things he told me was, Chris, the game creator and programmer, loved the game and had a very clear idea of where he wanted it to go. During development, I must have suggested hundreds of ideas to him, of which he maybe adopted one or two, with always a good reason as to why the idea was rejected. In that way, he kept sharp focus, and his aim was to make a game he would love to play and worry about how it would be sold later. 
Chris Sawyer was making the game he wanted to play. It was his vision coming to life. How it will be sold would be a bridge crossed when he got to it. But nowadays, most of the games in the AAA gaming space exist primarily as a product being sold first and foremost. Only after that is it a vision coming to life. You've probably got a team deciding what can be sold first and foremost, and then somebody has to try and bring a vision to life from that premise, rather than it being the other way around. And that's something felt very strongly in series like Rollercoaster Tycoon. Mr. Foster went on to tell me, I think the original games were a very good example of how the enlightened despotism of one person, with a sidekick doing the graphics and a sound guy who was talented, wins out every time over a design by committee which, I imagine, is being badgered by a marketing department. Design by committee essentially means many people all trying to change things in different ways, rather than one or a handful of people's vision coming to life. We've seen it with games such as Skull and Bones, which may never see the light of day due to 8 years of executives not being able to agree on what their game is. There's always those trying to change a product in myriad different ways, reason most often being a better way to sell said product or make additional revenue in some way. In this way, I find it hard to believe for a lot of AAA games that it's really somebody's vision coming to life. Somebody or a small group of people truly crafting the game they themselves would best like to play. Do you think somebody at EA introduced loot boxes because they would make their game better by introducing surprise mechanics as they'd have you believe? Do you think that those behind insert whatever mobile app here think the experience is best when it cuts you off from playing anymore today unless you pull out the modern cheat codes, your credit card number? Do you think that those behind Assassin's Creed 4 and Rogue think that the best experience for the player is to have no guidance on the collectible items unless they shell out for the time saver packs that mark the items on the map? Do you believe that those behind Tales of Arise believe the best player experience is one where the menu option to change the battle music is locked behind a $45 paywall? That you can only hold 15 consumables unless you shell out $7 for it to increase to $99, the cap that almost any other game would have had from the get-go? That in a single-player game, you can pay $7 to permanently double how much experience you earn? Do you think that those behind Skyward Sword HD believe that the best version of Skyward Sword has none of the textures changed from a decade ago, and that the best version of their game looks like this. When it comes to none of the textures being changed since the original Wii version, just, just take this in, these walls. Do you think that literally any game ever with a pre-order bonus genuinely believe that the best player experience is one where it's only possible to get everything if you bought it right when it came out? Assassin's Creed Unity. Pre-order now for two bonus offers. The Guillotine Spin to Win game. Get a chance to win prizes every Friday. And the explosive Chemical Revolution mission. Pre-order now. The AAA gaming space can still have someone's vision come to life to some degree, but it's gradually becoming more and more overshadowed by design by committee, countless others trying to change things in ways for different reasons, typically for a greater profit. To say that almost any modern AAA game is truly made as the perfect ideal game in the eyes of the director or group of creative higher-ups as the best possible game they themselves want to play will most likely be false, sadly. This is an issue we see in the AAA gaming space in general, and is something we'll delve deeper into in a future video essay. So, we don't really treat video games as products being sold, but rather, as social and cultural impactors on our lives. Because of this, they can become really important to us, and it can hurt when it seems like somebody said something negative about something that's had such a profound impact on us. For some who see an IP they love criticized, they suddenly feel the need to stand up and be the hero these multi-billion dollar companies need. Or for some, there's the feeling that because they didn't enjoy something, nobody else is allowed to either. We wind up in situations like angry YouTube threads, Twitter wars, or even targeted harassment in some cases. And so wage the video game opinion internet wars. For some people, it can be easy to get carried away, forget that this is a product being sold, that nothing is owed to these companies creating a product, to wrongfully believe that the root issue anyone who disagrees must have is just an IP getting big or that there is generic change, that they're not allowed to have an opinion because they're not a specialist in the field or that they're not allowed to have an opinion on information that a company chose to share, or they're not allowed to have an opinion because they're not the target audience. 
or that the product being sold is 100% the ideal perfect version of what somebody in charge there would truly want to play themselves. I've been getting comments that follow one of these ideas or another almost every day for the past 8 months now. I knew I was painting a target on my back making a video essay criticizing Pokemon, but it almost feels like it's driven me to the brink of insanity. Some nights I straight up have trouble sleeping when I just can't stop thinking about it. I know when I cover Pokemon Brilliant Diamond on the channel for review purposes, there are absolutely going to be those who hate me for it. I can already hear it. You're contributing to the problem. You're such a hypocrite. How dare you support such a thing after that essay you made? Since when did reviews stop being a legitimate reason to cover and discuss something? Imagine you're a food critic and don't like the direction this food place has been going with their cuisine, so other customers in the restaurant come over to your table. Well, you're supporting this place you say is so bad, it's your fault things are the way they are. Stop ruining the enjoyment for everyone else. <sighs> At the end of the day, everyone will enjoy what they want to enjoy. They'll get involved with what they want to get involved with. They'll play what they want to play. They'll be passionate about what they want to be passionate about. It's your right to choose. Some will try to take that away from you, but it's nobody's choice but your own. Am I pessimistic about the modern state of Pokemon? Yep. Does that mean you have to be as well? Absolutely not. My ideas don't have to be your own. But it is important to be open to hearing and understanding other ideas. If you're this far into the video, it means you probably already feel that way. Heck, if you're passionate about some game, even if I'm not, I invite you to join the Discord server and tell me about it. Share your passion. Isn't that the magical thing about how interconnected the world is with this thing we call the internet? How it's so many different people and personalities with their own experiences, interests, criticisms, and even passions all coming together. Maybe it's high time we start celebrating that, rather than shunning it. I can't words today! I can't words a lot of days, it feels like. Rain can When did that happen? Was I not paying attention? Because you got a cadab on the heaters. No. What the heck? The sandstorm rages? What is going on? It was just raining, now it's sandstorming? When did this happen? What is going on? The sunlight is strong. What is happening? Hail continues to fall. 